From CGTN headquarters in Beijing, this is The Hub with Wang Guan. Hello and welcome to The Hub. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. It is mission success for China as spacecraft Shenzhou-13 brought back three Chinese taikonauts home Saturday morning after spending six months at the Chinese space station. All three, Mission Commander Zhai Zhigang, Wang Yaping, the first Chinese woman to do a spacewalk, and Ye Guangfu are all in good shape. This is a national record for the longest stay in space. The previous crew spent three months in orbit. What are the achievements of this mission, and what's next for China's space program? For more on this, we have with us today Mr. Xu Yansong, Director General of the Asia-Pacific Space Cooperation Organization in Beijing. Mr. Xu, welcome back to the Hub. First of all, um, tell us, what are the emotions when you saw the three Chinese astronauts coming out of the module? Uh, well, you know, there's a, a crowd of uh, excitement of, uh, uh, of the whole nation. People uh, uh, look into these images that uh, the astronauts came out of the capsule, uh, and waving to the crowds, and there was also an immediate interview I saw the whole process this morning at CGTN. It was very exciting, and it was uh, it was a, a complete successful story for the uh, mission to to be accomplished in such a fashion of a, a splashdown. What we call it, the landing process was uh, more than perfect. Uh, it, it, all the timings, all the sequence was successful, and also this was a, the first time they are attempting the fast landing process, uh, which take five orbit. Uh, from the, the from the cap, uh, these, uh, capsule of Shenzhou uh, 13. So uh, in comparison with the 20 plus hours of landing of the Shenzhou 12, this is uh, a very good and successful landing because this uh, fast landing requires a very precise control of the spacecraft, in, in particular the uh, attack angle that the uh, capsule can enter the atmosphere. So it was a very successful mission, a very exciting uh, atmosphere in, uh, in, in, of the whole nation. You know, Mr. Xu, the three astronauts looked in better shape than I personally thought they would be, right? After spending six months in space, uh, when they were interviewed by the news media, uh, they were pretty much in good shape, talking to the news media, you know, uh, interacting, uh, smiling at the cameras. Uh, how come after six months, they're still in really amazing shape, allow me to say? Well, uh, you see from the, uh, the, the whole process, they were uh, dragged out of the capsule and it was carried on the chair. So after six months, they were experiencing a lot of uh, bone mass loss as well as muscle loss. And their cardio cardiovascular system also needs to be uh, uh, repaired. So uh, after six months of, uh, of microgravity environment, in fact, they're, they're quite... Uh, uh, they're quite not used to the gravity, and this is the first time they experienced the gravity uh, this morning. So, um, even, but you don't see them catching, they, they catching their breath shape. or anything, right, during uh, talking to the news media. Yes, they were. They were very. Uh, they were uh, very. Uh, uh, in, in, very much in good condition because we see the astronauts are are, are conducting trainings and exercise every day. Uh, people are saying that they have exercise every. Uh, every day, two hours uh, of exercise, including including the thread mills and, and elastic band to resist it, uh, to to maintain their muscle mass and, and, and bone mass. You, you know, I'm really curious about this. What is it like to return from space after six months? I mean, after living in almost zero gravity for six months, what are the challenges of the three Chinese astronauts returning home, and how do they really handle uh, the differences? Well, I think uh, you would you you can imagine yourself submerged in water uh, for uh, for extended period of time, and when you walk out of the swimming pool, uh, you would feel very heavy your, uh, of your body. So the returning process uh, of the capsule uh, uh, takes about uh, two hours, uh, and the the returning uh, in, in particular after the microgravity environment, there is a blackout uh, from 100 kilometers all the way to 60 kilometers altitude. And after the blackout, there is a deployment of parachute. And that deployment of parachute, the astronauts really can feel it because the, the, uh, there is an immediate drag of uh, about two or three Gs to the astronaut's body so that they feel the gravity for the first time in six months. And then after that, there is a landing process that will be relatively smooth. And then there is a retro uh, engine that fires at two meters altitude. 
so uh, before the landing. So the whole thing is a quite a ride, quite exciting ride for the astronauts, in particular after six months of microgravity environment. So that is more or less a challenging and it's the first time in six months they experience gravity. Let's talk about this blackout zone that seems to be straight out of a science fiction. The blackout zone that Taikonauts have to pass through while returning to the Earth. Uh, what is this black zone? And especially since the Taikonauts lose contact with the ground crew while passing through this blackout zone, how dangerous could this all be? Well, let's say that the landing process uh, has uh, about three or four stages. The first stage is the separation of the return capsule along with the service module uh, from the station itself. So that's 400 kilometers altitude. So they have to then, using the five orbits, to descend from 400 kilometers uh, altitude to 145 kilometers altitude. And then there's a separation of the, uh, of the service module. Uh, and then the, uh, the, the capsule uh, will start uh, entering the Earth using atmosphere as a drag and to slow it down. So there's a fric strong friction of the capsule uh, with the atmosphere, and that creates plasma and many other factors. So these plasma it re prevent the communication signals from, uh, from getting into or out of the capsule itself. So that's about four to six minutes of blackouts, depending on the angle of the attack. So that's a, a strong friction, and using the atmosphere to slow the capsule down from the astronomical uh, speed of seven kilometers per second all the way to three, uh, three or 200 meters per second before the parachute deployed. So that's the blackout period. This is truly phenomenal, and thank you all. Thank you so much for explaining all this to our audience. We know that Wang Yaping became the first Chinese woman to live in the Chinese space station. She's also the first Chinese woman to actually spacewalk. Are there additional challenges for women, taikonauts, or astronauts staying in space? Well, Wang Yangping is the, uh, the number one now for, uh, in terms of timing, uh, spent in space. So she, she spent about 15 days before and then before this mission, and then plus this mission. So there is a, a biggest uh, record of timing, uh, spending, accumulated time spent in space. So uh, for females to, spay, uh, to stay in, in outer space, uh, the challenge is more or less the uh, same, or even a little bit more. Uh, and you need to have uh, more... Uh, endurance to space environment and also you have to tailor made the spacesuit for EVAs, uh, for smaller figures and for, for ladies it's more challenging in all aspects uh, in compared with men. So uh, I think in the future missions we would also have a good combination of, of men and, and women but at this stage there is uh, where the focus is in the construction of the Chinese space station including the two uh, Wentian and Mengtian fuselage that's due to be integrated into the, the Tiangong station that will form a T-shaped uh, space station with a total of 92 metric tons and in outer orbit. Fair to say that Wang Yaping has made us all so very proud today, uh, as long, uh, along with uh, two other astronauts for sure. Now, finally, the Shenzhou 13 mission has set a new national record, as we said. It is China's longest manned mission, staying in space for six months. Uh, what, is it, what is its sig significance overall? Well, I think uh, it's unprecedented so far. There's a, uh, uh, we have the last mission was uh, the longest one was three months. So with this six month uh, extended stay in outer space, uh, there is a, a careful study. Uh, the, there's a, uh, some uh, particular changes to the, uh, uh, to the physical uh, condition of the astronauts. Uh, uh, we know that once you're in outer space, you don't have to use a lot of strength and you, your bone mass would lose. So all of this can be studied uh, uh, once they're back to Earth and uh, uh, after the debriefing and during the whole recovery process. And there's an, also a nervous system and also cardiovascular system. So all the circulation system is also uh, changed. And also the balance of people uh, with, you, with your uh, inner ears and inner shows. That, that all of these uh, small changes needs to be carefully studied. So we had extended uh, period of stay in outer space that's uh, one step for uh, the uh, permanent station of the manned uh, station in, 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 uh, in the Chinese space station. And also that's a, also a preparation phase for future more ambitious programs, such as uh, uh, lunar programs or even Mars missions, uh, where sending a man to Mars would need uh, even a longer period of time to stay in outer space. So all of this 
is, is part of this mission studies and this, the result of this experiment is also valuable for future missions preparation. Alrighty, good luck with all the future endeavors. Uh, Mr. Xu Yansung, Director General at the Asia Pacific Space Cooperation Organization in Beijing, thank you so much for joining us at this hour. Now, the multifaceted China-U.S. relationship has been evolving through different stages, from panda diplomacy to pandemic politics. In the 50 years of China's panda diplomacy, let's look at the ups and downs in the relationship. And more importantly, perhaps, will the two countries reconcile with their differences for the future of mankind? Everyone loves them. They're furry, naughty, and lovely. The black and white bamboo eater has got us under his thumb and the lovers just go bananas whether these adorable living fossil is frolicking in the snow or clumsily climbing on trees. Oh, I like that they can climb trees. What do you like about pandas? I like them eating bamboos. They're just cool. They're just laid back, minding their own business, relaxed in life, you know, no worries. But the addictive crater comes from only one country, that's China. But in the U.S., it started 50 years ago. On April 16, 1972, Ling Ling and Xing Xin arrived in Washington. They were welcomed by thousands of panda-admiring Americans and Pat Nixon, the then U.S. First Lady. On behalf of the people of the United States, I am pleased to be here and accept the precious gift of the panda pandas and also these other mementos from the government of the People's Republic of China. The pair she greeted became a symbol of Beijing Washington rapper's mom broke it under her husband's administration. Before the arrival of the pandas, President Richard Nixon made a historic visit to China. On the second day of his ice-breaking journey, the Nixons went to Beijing Zoo and saw pandas there. The chubby black and white bears captured the heart of Mrs. Nixon. China promised to send two pandas to the U.S. as a way of extending friendship. Fifty years have passed. Giant pandas are now more than a diplomatic tool. They've become a conservation success story for both countries. So we had Ling Ling and Xing Xing, Tian Tian and Mei Shang, Tai Shan, Bao Bao, Bei Bei, and now Chao Qi Ji. Overseas pandas link China and the rest of the world. Chinese and American researchers have worked together to save this once endangered species and protect them in the wild and in captivity. Cooperation has been made headways as pandas have been loaned by the Chinese government since 1980s. The cubs born in foreign countries, as stipulated, also belong to China. But half a century later, the China-U.S. relations have gone sour. The fuzzy and gentle creatures are not cute anymore in the eyes of some American politicians. We should not fund China's panda propaganda campaign. Let's get serious with our diplomacy and hit China where it hurts. Give freedom to the pandas and allow them to stay here in the United States. A symbol of friendship and goodwill or a tool for propaganda? A question for serious pundits, not for pandas. One thing is certain though, panda lovers around the world will always be captivated and asking for more. Now joining me to discuss the panda diplomacy, the China-US relations and much more is Jeffrey Sachs from New York City. He is a professor and director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University. Professor Sachs, so good to have you with us here on The Hub on CGTN. I'm not sure if panda is your forte exactly, but uh, man, we're, we're marking the 50th anniversary of panda diplomacy. I feel obliged to ask you about this. What role do you think panda diplomacy has played in U.S.-China relations in the past half a century? Well, it was the beginning of uh, the opening of what was a, a good and fruitful relationship in, until recently when things uh, have really turned sour. But it's interesting for me reflecting, it's, it's this weekend 50 years ago that for me, I had another aspect of this kind of cultural diplomacy, which was ping pong diplomacy. I went to see the Chinese ping pong team in Detroit, where I was growing up. That was also part of the opening. But that was the, the beginning of normal relations between two countries that had been at odds with each other uh, because of uh, the events around the Chinese Civil War and, and afterward. And this was extremely important for the world. 
that the United States and China began a path of uh, not only mutual acceptance, but, but actually cooperation. And I think that that is extraordinarily important that we get back to that path now. But don't you think, Professor Sachs, that given the circumstances, given the realities on both sides, and given the constraints on U.S.-China relations, the role of cultural diplomacy, i.e. panda diplomacy, is decreasing um, when it comes to what they can do to improve China-U.S. relations? It, it is, in fact, but that doesn't have to be our only reality. We just saw a congresswoman uh, you know, sternly saying we have to uh, hit China hard. This is a terrible idea. Uh, it is a widespread idea in the United States. Uh, and uh, In Washington it, it, or it, it, in the U.S. or just in Washington? Well, you know, Washington affects, unfortunately, the public media, uh, the mass media. So we have lots of stories that say China's the enemy, which is horrible. Uh, it's based on nothing, uh, in fact, especially when we need cooperation, cooperation to fight a pandemic, cooperation to fight uh, human-made climate change, cooperation to uh, stop this war in Ukraine. We, we need the two sides working together. And the reality, the deep reality, is that we have common interests. Uh, but right now, the politics is, unfortunately, uh, really, uh, in the U.S. side, very hostile uh, and, I think, uh, absolutely wrongly directed. But Professor Sachs, uh, many, if not most, of the experts that I talk to, strategists on both sides, um, who are pretty much influenced by the realist school of thought in international relations, predict that China-U.S. relations, like it or not, will only get worse in the coming years and decades, where strategic competition will only get fiercer. Do you share that pessimism? I don't. You know, what's called realism is a kind of cynicism. It says, assume the worst about the other side and then act on your assumptions that the worst is true. That's what realism is in foreign policy thinking. This is the wrong way to proceed. We need to start from a different point of view. The planet is very small. It's crowded. It's actually quite dangerous right now for many, many reasons, whether it's war uh, or disease uh, or climate change. And we have so much at common uh, so many common interests. So I don't agree that uh, we're doomed to have worsening relations. It's true. That is the current trend. I'm not a great fan of the politicians in the United States who say this. I don't think they know China very well. Uh, I've had the opportunity to, to visit China hundreds of times. I don't know many of these, have, whether they've ever been once. Uh, so I think if we have much more dialogue, then this so-called realism will become a different kind of realism, a realism of our mutual stakes in cooperation, because that's the deeper truth in my view. That's very instructive. Um, let's talk about, talk about the economy. The global economy is in a very sorry state of affairs, so however you look at it. What do you identify as the major challenges for both the Chinese economy and the U.S. economy and uh, does that merit more cooperation uh, between Washington and Beijing? There, there really are three uh, points that are uh, destabilizing the world right now. One is Ukraine, the war, and the U.S. sanctions and the, the Western sanctions. We need the war to end. We need a diplomatic solution to this war. There's not going to be a military solution. Militarily, it would just be escalation. Ending the war improves the world economy tremendously. We need both parties to be at the negotiating table. So that's number one. Second is the pandemic. We're still struggling with the pandemic everywhere. In New York City, the cases are way up this week because of the new Omicron variant. So we need to work together for vaccine coverage, for proper public health measures, so that we're stopping the pandemic because the pandemic has really destabilized the world economy. Third is financial cooperation. Uh, right now, uh, we have an unstable global financial situation made worse by the war and by the pandemic. And we need the People's Bank of China and the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank sitting down together to strategize how to ensure 
that there is global financial stability. So these are the main points. You know, end the war, uh, get the pandemic under control, cooperate financially, but they all point in the same direction. If we have conflict, we're not going to succeed on any of these, and the world economy is going to be tremendously destabilized. You wrote on Project Syndicate that it is time to talk about what a reasonable peace settlement uh, look like uh, when it comes to the Ukraine crisis. What should a reasonable peace process look like, and how can breakthroughs be made at this point? We need Ukraine to be safe, secure, and neutral. Part of the uh, problem here is that NATO has said, we're going to move to Ukraine. And Russia has said, why should we have a US-led military alliance right on our border? That's very dangerous. The solution is Ukraine's neutrality protected by the United Nations, by the United Nations Security Council. So I want NATO not to enlarge. I want Ukraine to be safe. I want the Russian troops to go home and for the war to end. And I want for the UN to play its proper role as the global peacekeeper, the global rule of law that stops war. And the UN Security Council, I think, has a huge role to play. I believe that there can be a negotiated outcome but, you know, when a war starts, everything is about escalation. Everything is about war talk, heavier weapons. Uh, everybody thinks they're going to win on the battlefield. But there, is, there are no victors on this battlefield. Uh, both Ukraine will be reduced to rubble, tragically. Thousands or tens of thousands of lives will be lost in the coming days unless we get to the negotiating table. But we can do this. And the U.S. and China have a common interest in getting those two parties to say, this is a reasonable outcome. And that's really what we need to do. Professor Sachs, you have been very vocal about sanctions. How, have, how effective, rather, have the US and NATO sanctions against Russia been, in your opinion? Sanctions can cause harm and damage, but they don't change real outcomes. The US has been using harsh sanctions against many countries, against Venezuela, uh, against Iran, against North Korea and others. They punish, but they don't solve problems. They don't lead to the political outcomes. Political outcomes come through diplomacy. They don't come through the battlefield and they don't come through unilateral sanctions. Now it happens with the sanctions on Russia that the consequences are not just harmful for Russia, clearly they are, but for the whole world. Uh, now we have poor people in poor countries facing soaring food prices. Uh, we have a destabilization of the whole world economy. Now, the answer to this is peace negotiations quickly before this absolutely gets out of hand. There are so many issues I want to pick or bring on. Uh, let's talk about COVID. Uh, you know, there are mostly two schools of thought uh, globally when it comes to how to deal with COVID. Dynamic zero, which is practiced largely in China, uh, which is still the case now, and a coexistence, uh, which is practiced by many more countries around the world. Um, how would you comment on these two different approaches? And in particular, can you comment on the U.S. approach of coexistence? Well, the U.S., remember, has had 1.2 million deaths from COVID. Uh, China avoided mass deaths. So the zero COVID or the dynamic zero COVID policy in the first couple of years saved so many lives, not only in China, but uh, across East, East Asia, uh, the Asia Pacific region. Uh, the US and Europe suffered millions and millions of deaths as a result of a, a lax policy. But it gets harder because Omicron is so infective. The control is very difficult. So what we really need also is a vaccine plus strategy going forward. Good vaccination coverage. I would like to see the best vaccines available everywhere. Uh, I would like to see uh, everything that we've learned on science on all sides to be openly accessible for all countries and to ensure that we have vaccine coverage everywhere so that we don't have more variants spreading. We're now suffering in New York City today. A new variant of Omicron has come, and the cases are, are way up. 
And in the United States, people don't wear face masks even. Now, that's ridiculous. That's sad. It's tragic. Uh, people have politicized face masks. Yeah. Don't politicize face masks. They keep yeah. people alive. They stop the spread of the disease. But we're in a kind of open environment where it's not just living with it, it it's uh, it, it's being uh, completely disrespectful of other people uh, by walking around without protection for yourself and for others. And this is part of uh, the problem in, in a large, large part of the world, including uh, my own country. Right. Uh, finally, let's talk about globalization. Your new book has been about globalization. Its name is called The Ages of Globalization. And you really talk about the need for new methods of international governance and cooperation to prevent conflicts and also to achieve sustainable development goals. Um, can you give us a, a snapshot of your book? Well, I, I talk about the fact that the world, human society, has been globalized uh, you know, from the beginning of our history. We've always traded, migrated, moved, exchanged ideas, and so forth. And people say, well, globalization is going away right now. We're deglobalizing. I don't believe it. We're so interconnected. And in the digital age, we're more interconnected than ever. But we do need ground rules that make sense because, as I show in the book, every time a new major transformation has taken place, whether it was the steam engine two centuries ago or the digital age today, that has led to tensions, conflict, and often war. So the main thing is we've got to avoid war as we enter a new digital age. And that's why dialogue is absolutely our most important common tool, because if we don't have dialogue, we're not going to make it. If we're just shouting against each other or just using social media for propaganda purposes, we're lost. But if we have dialogue, we can find the way through. Uh, finally, there are two guiding principles in the past century, let's say, uh, about international relations. One is liberalism and the other being realism. But do you think the past paradigms, such as realism and liberalism, are, are no longer good to predict how states interact in the future, um, given the scale of the changes? Uh, do we need adapted versions of those two paradigms or a whole new paradigm? We need the paradigm of multilateralism with sustainable development. That is uh, not to predict what will go wrong, but to guide what we need, which is cooperation to face common challenges. That's the multilateral system. The best idea a US president ever had, in my view, uh, was uh, Franklin Roosevelt's idea of the United Nations. And we need to make this system work for all countries, not for one country or another country, I don't like alliances. I don't like blocks. We're together. We're on this planet together. It's a small planet, and it's very fragile right now. So multilateral, sustainable development should be our guidepost for the 21st century. Professor Jaffrey Sachs, professor and director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University. Thank you so much for joining us. We learned a lot. Thanks. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you. All right, and that will do it for this edition of The Hub on CGTN. What you think matters. Send us a message on Weibo, Douyin, or other social media platform. Thanks for joining us. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. Our news coverage continues. Bye and take care.